Hello again. Welcome along to a very special edition of the Sheffield United podcast that we call One of Our Own. Today's guest is widely regarded as the club's greatest ever manager. And who are we to argue? He led Sheffield United to two promotions and an FA Cup semi-final and loads of other memorable games along the way. He is simply a legend of the lane. It is Dave Bassett. Great to see you. How are you? Yeah, very well, very well. Got a few little problems, a bit of prostate cancer, but it's being dealt with. Oh, isn't it? good. I, yeah. di- I didn't know about that. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, 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 it's been diagnosed. I've been there and I'm um, due to have a bit of radiotherapy, but I'm quite chilled out about it because the urologist who inspected me said, look, you know, you, you needn't do anything. You've got a good eight or ten years left in you if you want to, he said, but if you want a belt and braces job, we can do it. So I said, well, let's go for it. And uh, so I've had all the tests and everything else. So uh, the final bit, hopefully they clear it up. So, yeah, I mean, I feel good. Good. You're looking well. Yeah, looking I well. feel good. I'm fit. I'm playing golf. I'm going around and, uh, you know, it's, it's not been a problem to me. What's it like being back in here? Yeah, yeah. It brings back memories. It's slightly changed, but, I, you know, I can sort of see the old dressing room there. You know, it was a good dressing room, a big one and comfortable and it was part of the, and the stand and everything else. So, yeah, it's bring back memories. I, you know, I've been back a couple of times and been in the dressing room where the players are. So, uh, yeah. A bit flashier than it was when... You were stood in here delivering team talks, I bet. Well, it's a bit more salubrious. It's a, a bit more done out. You know, it's been a bit more money spent on to it, you know, as such. But that was the case that most uh, stadiums weren't of this standard. If you go into any of the Premier League stadiums now and the dressing rooms, you know, they're like your dining room or, you know, your, your, your lounge as such. So, you know, very, very nice and comfortable as it should be. I mean, it's just part and parcel of the development of, of football and spending the money on facilities. We will, of course, come on to your time here shortly and your time as a manager, full stop. But I want to know a bit about Dave Bassett, the player, because you played at semi-pro level and that was it. So tell me a bit about that journey. Well, I, I, I was bombed at Chelsea when I was 17 by Tommy Doherty. He never saw me play, but he always said I was a crap player anyway. Um, <laughs> so I had What to- position? I was a front player then. Right, I was okay. playing there and uh, at Chelsea. I played a few times. I went on trips, but it uh, wasn't good. No, I was disappointed. I mean, I came home on the bus and I just said to me, Dad, you know, I've been released. He said, mm, obviously you ain't good enough. Well, you better find a job. You know, there was no compassion or sympathy. It was to get on with it. If, you, if you're good enough, you'll get. And then I went and played non-league for Hayes, who were a good non-league side. And I did well there. And, uh, you know, at 20 years old, Watford, asked me to go there for trials and I went there and uh, t- Ken Furphy who was manager yeah. here offered me a contract but the amazing part was they were in the third division south and uh, the ma- wages they were offering me in those times I was earning more from the job I was doing and uh, I had a car and a company mortgage and uh, I was getting paid for non-league football so you know and the money wasn't great and also I, I came to the conclusion that I didn't think I was good enough to play at the top level. I felt I perhaps could have earned a living for a few years in the, you know, the league below, the, you know, which was like the third and fourth division. Mm. But I realised I wasn't going to be, at, you know, going to Manchester United, Leeds United or anywhere like that. And I thought, well, no, I think I'll concentrate on my job and, uh, uh, and non-league football and uh, have to leave that. So uh, I made that decision. What was the job? What were you doing? I was in an insurance company. You know, uh, I was involved in insurance and uh, selling insurance, basically, and uh, doing mortgages and things like that. Uh, I bet you were good at that. Gift of the gab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I was top salesman for this company and uh, did well. Uh, but it was, a, it was a good job. But I broke my leg in 66. I missed playing at Wembley because I'd gone to a club called Hendon, who were a non-league mm-hmm. side, very good. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd missed the quarterfinals against Wickham Wanderers. And Jimmy Quayle, who was a really good player at non-league, could have been a pro easy, um, he broke his leg and on the Sunday I decided to go because I, I thought I'd do a bit of fitness and play for me mate Sunday side and broke my leg. So I missed the chance of playing for Hendon in the cup final, amateur cup final at, uh, against Wildstone that year. But then I recovered and I went back to Hayes 
and really the coaching I'd had was nothing. But then a guy called Alan Batsford appeared on the scene from Walton and Hersham who were doing well and he convinced me to join Walton and Hersham and from there on in I learnt a lot more about the game I played and Walton were a good side and I managed to then get in the England amateur side. I played for England in the amateur side, I got uh, 10 caps, I was sub about 12 times and I took Walton, and, well I was part of the team that Walton and Hersham went to the amateur cup final when I was captain and we won mm -hmm. the amateur cup in 1972, we beat Slough Town at Wembley in 42,000. But then amateur football finished and Alan Batsford got poached by Wimbledon to go there, who was semi-professional. They'd been amateur, they were just on hard times. And Alan asked me and five other players to go from Walton to, to Wimbledon, which we did. And then we had a fantastic three years uh, where we won the Southern League title, three years on the top. We had a great cup run, beating Burnley, drew with Leeds, lost the replay the following year, lost to Brentford in the second round, and then in the third round the following year, lost to Middlesbrough after a replay, and Wimbledon got in the Football League. And uh, I had one season there, and uh, halfway through that situation, Alan Batsford, the manager, resigned, shouldn't have done, and Ron Nodes, who was the chairman, offered me the job. I, want, you know, I was interested in coaching, I'd done my coaching badges at that time, but I just knew I wasn't ready ready to manage. Luckily, Dario Grady was the youth coach and Dar uh, Ron decided to promote him and uh, suggested to Dario that I be the assistant, which he took on board. And I worked, you know, three years with Dario, which was good. He was, a, he was an excellent coach. He was a good educator. I learned a lot, totally different from me. I was a hooligan. He was a proper man. Um, <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot from him. And as it turns out, then Ron Nodes got fed up with Wimbledon and decided to buy Crystal Palace and move there and he took Dario with him and I got promoted to the manager of Wimbledon in January 28, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, 1981 and um, uh, I became the manager, Wimbledon was 13th and we finished third and got promoted and I thought this not is, bad at this. Yeah, I thought this job's easy, you know, <laughs> anybody can do it. A year later when we got relegated, I knew it wasn't quite so easy. <laughs> I mean, what a journey you had with them. I mean, you must have so many special memories of your time with them, Crazy Gang and all that kind of thing. Yeah, oh, it was an unbelievable <clears throat> period. I was at Wimbledon, you know, nearly 13 and a half, 14 years. And I grew up with, you know, being part of a team that was a really good non-league. We were a top non-league side to do what we did. And uh, we were just grew old at that time. But luckily I played 30 odd times in the league, which was something I wanted to do and then I was sort of with Dario but I had the pleasure of working with young players like Mark Morris, Glenn Hodges, Paul Fishington, Wally Downs, Dave Besson. They were in the reserves and I was training them and uh, then when I got the first team job I more or less brought all them straight into the first team all at young ages and Kevin Gage 17-18 and um, as I say, we got that promotion and then Sam decided to sell our best players because he wanted money and uh, we had injuries to players. Alan Court broke his leg and we were down the bottom. It was, it was hard that year, but it was a great education for those young players because they had a season of knowing and battling against relegation and then the following year, they were ready to take on the fourth division, which they did. And I added one or two other players experience. And then, of course, we won the championship in the fourth division the following year. In the second, came second to Oxford in the third division. So we're in the second division. One mediocre season in the second division, midway. Beat Nottingham Forest in Drew Legs, got to the quarterfinals of the Milk Cup. Following year, got promoted to the top league. All done in nine years. Not bad, not bad going at all. I appreciate we're speeding through, but... We do want to get on to Sheffield United. That, that's why we're here. But oh, well, I think I, he was going to ask me about No, no. We, oh, honestly, we've reserved plenty of time for the Blades. But I do want to have a little chat with you about Watford because I, I've seen you interviewed before and your dealings with Elton John and all that kind of thing when you went to his house, I think, at one stage as well. Tell us a little bit about that because that's a great story. Well, I mean, uh, uh, with Wimbledon, unfortunately, uh, my relationship with Sam, her man, was deteriorating uh, to some extent. And he never for, re, forgave me because when we got promoted out of the third division to the second, Ron Nodes, who I knew, always wanted me to be the manager of Wimbledon, but he then wanted me to be the manager of Crystal Palace. My contract was up and Ron convinced me, offered me more money, said it was better, the crowds were better at Crystal Palace. Wimbledon was not going anywhere really. The crowds, that's why he left. Their crowds were only 2,300, 3,000. And he convinced me to go. And somehow I got sucked in because I went to school with Ron's 
brother uh, and that. And I, I went there and then all of a sudden I realised, uh, you know, I slept there and I just thought, why am I going? I think this Wimbledon team's good. Why am I going to Crystal Palace? I've got to start mm. all over again. So I phoned Ron up and said, look, I, I, I don't want to come. I knew the door was still open, but Sam really had the ump that I was going to leave to go there. And that, Anyway, so Ron got blamed in the press, which wasn't his fault. It was my decision. It was just a, a change of heart, and luckily the door was open. And of course, we had a fantastic season, you know, in that, the second division. As I say, we had the first season mid-table and the cup run, then the following season promotion, and then, you know, the, a great season in the top division in our first season to finish six and get to the quarterfinals of the FA Cup it was unbelievable for a club whose wage bill was non-existent compared with everybody else's in that and it was a great for the players because uh, seven of that team had played in the fourth division, the third division, the second division and the top league. You know, seven players mm. came through that and with that final year we had a squad of 23 players, 12 come through the youth team. Wow. Nobody gives us all they talk about Manchester United, Beckham and all them. But we had, you know, all, the, all those players, Hodges, uh, Fishingdon, what Downs, uh, Gwizey, all them were, were youth players and that, you know, and uh, we signed Vinny for 10 grand, which was a bargain. And uh, Fash helped us as well. So, you know, we did, they did remarkably well. But but Sam was messing me about about my contract and everything else. And I was earning absolute peanuts, you know me. Mm -hmm. And he, he just, you know, wouldn't sort of go. He, was, he couldn't cope with the fact that the fans were idolising me and not him. He thought they should have been idolising him for keeping the club going, uh, and which, you know, of course, the fans don't care about the directors. You know, they want the players and everything else. So what happened is I decided to serve notice. I've been in for an interview at uh, Manchester City where they were arming an R in, and then all of a sudden I went to the cup final that year, which was Everton and Liverpool, and I come home and as I got to the door, my wife opened the door and I thought, what's she opening the door for? She don't normally do that. She knows I've got keys. And she said, you ain't going to believe who's here. And I said, well, you, you know, inform me. Then, then all of a sudden, Elton John come prancing out the lounge. And you're, I've got to say, I was stunned. You know, one thought come, I hope the missus told him we ain't got a piano. But that, that was an afterthought. But, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm starstruck. Elton John, what's yeah, he doing in my you house? Be, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, he's friendly as hell, but I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, I can't imagine that I'm ever going to see Elton John or he's going to talk to me. And we sat down and he then told me that Graham T Taylor was going to leave Watford, who was a god. They loved him and did a brilliant job. And he wanted me as manager. Well, you know, it was a big mistake for him to decide he wanted me manager straight away. And he put me under pressure. And, and it seemed ideal because Watford was right near where I um, lived and I made a decision to go there and it was too quick I made the decision because I didn't really do any due diligence on Watford uh, to find out what was going on. I should have mm. said, well, hold on a minute, I, I don't want to make this decision. He was going to China with the team on the Wednesday and he wanted a decision straight away. And I got talked into it. And he's, you know, he's, he's charismatic and he's very powerful, you know, intelligent bloke. And, um, you know, I, I made a mistake because I, I, the first thing I realised after I'd agreed to go was John Barnes was leaving. And after I'd seen the videos and realised that John Barnes had kept him up. And then I found out that Mark Falcon was going to Glasgow Rangers. Uh, John McLennan wanted to go, but didn't. Tim, uh, Kevin Richardson was going, wanted to go to the Arsenal. Dave Barsley. So I walked into a minefield where it wasn't. Mm. And also, the local newspaper didn't fancy me. I wasn't the manager they expected from Wimbledon. You know, this hooligan team, you know, wasn't Watford. You know, Watford were a bit of a posh team, they thought. And uh, so it just got off on the wrong foot. I, I, I mean, I, I did the pre-season and we started. And I said to my missus, this ain't going to last. This team's crap. You know, uh, it's going to be a fight against relegation. And, and of course there was reports and the fans were against me and it was a miserable six months really but Elton was brilliant he looked after me uh, you know and looked after me fantastic you know I mean I got paid a reasonable sum of Watford uh, by Watford but he also then bought the club car that I had from Watford to give to me and then he paid for me my wife and the two kids to go to California for two weeks everything in play the, the hotels flights and everything else uh, and he gave the wife a fur coat as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Right, Sheffield United. How, how did that come about? How did you end up here, Dave? Ron Nodes 
as I say, who, who I knew well, uh, and that well, Watford uh, were just before Christmas, and it was things were turning a bit edgy. John McClellan, and I left Tony Coat Co 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 out the side, you know. So there was, you know, there was uh, tin helmet time, you know. Mm. But I did give the debuts at that time to Timmy Sherwood, Malcolm Allen, Ewan Roberts. Gary Porter, I put all the youngsters in who were some good players. Um, so it was there, you needed results. Well, anyway, it was just before Christmas and Ron Nodes rung me up. And uh, I always remember uh, I took the kids to a pantomime where, uh, the, you know, Anita Dobson was in right. and everything else uh, there, there with the wife. And Ron rung me and mum said, get off the phone. And I said, well, Ron wants me. She said, well, can't you speak to him later? I said, well, no. So I said to Ron, he said, look, uh, Harry, you're going to get the sack at Watford. It's not if, it's when. Uh, I said, oh, thanks very much, Ron, for the vote of confidence. <laughs> um, he said, you'll be going. And he said, look, I've had Reg Brearley, Sheffield United, uh, on the phone asking my advice. Do I know who what, could I recommend a manager? And so I've told him to come and get you. Mm. And he's keen. He's, he'd like to speak to you and everything else. I said, oh, well, that's handy. He said, well, leave Watford and go to Sheffield United, can't you? <laughs> I said, yeah, all right, thanks, Rob. So I had to get through the Christmas period and... Um, at that time, and uh, anyway, I spoke to Reg Brearley, and he said, look, you know, well, we, we can't do anything now. I said, well, no, no, I can't, you know. I said, it's close. I said, I can sense that, you know, yeah. if, unless I win these four games over Christmas and the cup tie against Hull, I think, you know, I've had it, you know. I, I said, uh, it's just a matter of time. Um, so I said, he said, well, look, you know, uh, uh, we'd like to keep in touch. Would you be interested? I said, of course I would. You know, I've been to Sheffield United and uh, I thought, well, yeah, this is it. So I did a bit of due diligence in that time and everything else. So I got through the Christmas period and uh, we drew at Portsmouth 2-2, two -two, got done with an offside goal in the last minute. We were winning 2-1. Then we uh, played Tottenham and uh, again got done. They were given a dodgy penalty at the time. And then we played Manchester United um, uh, at uh, home, um, we, Tony had gone and murdered them, but we lost 1-0, but it was a real good performance. Mm. Um, so it was then, you know, I went back home and uh, I got a phone call from Milton and he said, Harry, I'm round John Reed's house. He said, he don't live far from you and everything else. Come round, we'll have a chat. So I, he said, I've sent uh, Derek me driver for you. So that was a fate of complaint, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, so I just sent the missus, uh, the tin tax round the corner. Um, so it was over there and we had a good drink and he played a trick on me uh, about a dice and getting a sack and that. And so this is, the, this is the cushion that looks like a dice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and he said yeah, if you yeah, roll yeah, a seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you, and you ended up here. What, what did you walk into when you arrived at Sheffield United? What, what was life like up north for you? Because obviously growing up down south, what was it like coming to South Yeah, I, I, I felt that I wanted to get out of London, you know, and, and, it was, and I wanted to get back into work quick. You know, so basically with me gone, I was at Sheffield United within the sort of week because I went mm -hmm. to see the team play at Bournemouth and I've got to say I thought I've got my work cut out here they were down the bottom um, you know they were trying they won 2-1 and I met uh, uh, um, Derek Dooley and uh, Paul Wallhouse and Michael Ragg uh, down there at that time uh, before the game uh, you know and had an interview with them and talked to them and Derek was you know an football man was impressive you know I thought I like that there's a football man on the board who understands football because on a lot of boards they don't have football people on the board mm. they've got the executives they're there they, you know they live on cliches and what they read in the paper and all that you know and, and I thought yeah so what had happened is I think they were impressed and they recommended me to Reg and then I had to go up to Reg to Lincoln to see him and he more or less just rubber stamped it and said, you know, you can come. You know, he said, David, you know, uh, uh, we're impressed with what you've done and everything else. We, you know, we're down the bottom of the league. He said, um, you know, the, our ambition is to get out of this division as soon as possible. I achieved that at the end of the season, took him into the third division. <laughs> I don't mean that's what Reg had in mind, but, you know. Uh, but... Uh, it was a squad where I came, there were some decent players here, but it was evidence they were lacking confidence. Uh, and, you know, we, we battled away and we ended up going into a playoff situation with Bristol City mm. at that particular time. You know, they'd got there and Peter, like people, Peter with was injured. He could only play that game and then got injured in that game. We had a few other players that were, were injured and not doing it. You know, luckily I tried to change it around. I, you know, I, I sold Martin Cole to Watford and took Peter Edderston and um, 
Tony Agana plus 20 grand, and a 20 grand bought Simon Webster. So that paid for itself in time. But, you know, we just couldn't quite turn it. And in the Bristol game, we, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, lost one nil down there uh, and they managed to get a draw. We just couldn't get it. We didn't have enough goal scorers uh, uh, at that time. I don't know why Richard Cadet didn't play. He must have been injured. Uh, he was around at that time. And Tony Agana, we, we should have done, but it just worked out. So, you know, in a way, I knew that the, the squad was old. Colin Morris, there was people that had been Peter with on loan, Phil Thompson, mm. Ken McNaught. You know, there was players that were there and luckily their contracts were up. So I was able to have a good clear out and start and bring in my own players. So when you start that process, when you're looking for new players, are you looking for similar characters to the ones you had at Wimbledon? Obviously, some players who you previously managed at Wimbledon ended up here. However, are you looking for a certain type at that yeah, point? Yeah, I was, I was, because I knew how I wanted to play. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I wasn't going to be able to get silky players that were going to be, you know, passing the ball around and everything else. I, mm. I wanted characters, I wanted players who were fit and athletic, who were going to work hard, uh, uh, and uh, I, I knew the type of player I, I, I wanted. You know, I was happy with... Um, a Garner here, Simon Webster was here, you know, young Chrissy Wilder was all right, uh, you, you know, Pikey was okay, yep. Toddy was okay, uh, Demps didn't want to play the, the way I wanted to play, so good bless him, he came out mm. and said, and he said, which was brilliant because he was honest, so we let him go to Rotherham where he wanted, you know, we'd let a lot of players go, so I was then in a position where I could bring players in, and at that particular time I brought Graham Benstead in, who I knew before, before Simon Tracy come. John Gannon, you know, I knew from Wimbledon was a good player in the youth. He wasn't going to get in the first team as such. I was able to get Ian Bryson from a contact uh, up in Scotland, who turned out to be a gem. Alan Roberts, again, uh, and Alan had a great season for us, but he didn't want to play the way we wanted to play at the end of that season. So he moved on to Lincoln the second season. Agana and Dean Gilled. You know, Tony was good for Dino, so we had that pace up front. John Francis joined us, at the, and it was quick as well and strong. Um, Toddy did the midfield, Pikey. Stan was a good man, you know, knew what the game was about. Good captain, good person around the place. Brian Smith was tough. Uh, you know, and he was a good centre half, um, and uh, Chrissy was okay at right back. Um, you know, it, it, so we we started to build the side round with what we want, who were strong and were were, were were built in. And I wanted to build a spirit. And we had a good pre-season. We went to Sweden for about ten days. Derek Dooley come, which was brilliant because Derek, being a football man, you know, I had a great relationship with him. He was ideal, you know, because he was a buffer between me and the board, you know. Um, you know, I didn't go to many ball meetings other than for probably a short period just at the end for them to ask questions. And Derek used to mark me card what to, to expect, what who would be and all that. And of course, Derek wasn't backward in coming because if any of them, you know, Bernard Proctor, bless him, Bernard used to come out with some absurd position, you know, it, you know, why don't we play him on the right wing or something? And then, you know, uh, Derek would say, that's a stupid question. Dave, don't even answer it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and he was brilliant. And uh, as I say, Derek worked with me when we were signing. I was, you know, as a manager then, I did all the wages. I had to, you know, do all the contracts right, okay. and signing, not like the managers now. But Derek was the good, good guy because if we was uh, arguing about a player and wages, I'd have to say, I've got to go and see Derek Dooley. He's the chief exec. I'd go and have a cup of tea with Derek and come mm. back and say, no, you can't have it. He ain't prepared to pay it. You either sign for that or not. Or, yeah, he'll give you the bit extra. You know and I me? Mean? And, and he understood, you know, the football. He, he loved being in Sweden at that particular time with us. He could see the work, what we did. We worked every day and we created a, a, a real good spirit at that time, you know, which was important because I know the, the commitment and, and the belief that the team is the more important than the individual. You know, some individuals shine, but he cannot become at the expense of the rest of the team. Mm. If he gets Larry, then he goes, disappears, OK, yeah. because that can't be the case. And, and so, yeah, great. So we and we got off to a good start and, and we started on the move. Yeah, you got promoted back at the first attempt. You mentioned Brian Dean there, and I'm going to sprinkle in some stories from, from old players. Not so much of a story from Brian, but I actually spoke to him this afternoon, and um, he spoke about, obviously, you bringing him here, and to quote him, he says he was extremely lucky to have Dave as a manager, spoke about the tough love that he gave him, but he really spoke at length about 
When he was having difficult times and he was struggling, you used to say to him, pull him to one side, don't worry about it, we've got other players in the team, a Garner will get you through. And he said that trust that developed between you and him was right at the, the centre point, really, for him to be able to succeed. Um, he spoke about your attention to detail and something else that we'll touch on later on about nutritionists, psychologists, fitness coaches, that kind of thing. Every single player who played under you have all said the same thing, that Dave was ahead of his time. And people speak about Arsene Wenger and how he revolutionised the game or allegedly revolutionised the game here. They all point to you and say, Harry was doing it way before. What's your reaction to some of the things you've heard there? Well, it was, it was quite natural to me because I did things at Wimbledon long before anybody else. You but know. you never got the recognition? Yeah, Did because, you? For doing stuff like no, that? No, well, we don't, and uh, Wimbledon don't get the recognition. The, what, the, the Wimbledon story is better than the Leicester story. Who's going to get a side that was go, go averaging gates of 2,300 to 2,800 from the fourth division to the first division, you know, and, and we, you know, we survived there where, you know, our top player at Wimbledon was earning about 220 quid a week, you know, where there was players in the Ian Rush was earning like 1,500 quid a week, mm. you know, they don't sound much, but you do. And also, you know, the thing is that Sam got, got it made, that what happened is I left him with a side where he made a, over 11 million pound profit. So my net savings, what the players I got for him were sold, and, and when you took away what I'd uh, sold players for or paid for them, mm. it was 11 million quid. The same thing happened at Sheffield United. I was here eight years. I made five million pound on transfers. You know, so we got all that success at Sheffield United, and I made them five million quid. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, you evaluate that. Any manager, I'd like to see any other managers done it. When Graham Taylor took Watford up, he spent a lot more money than I did. You with me? Yeah. And the players there. And you know, Besson played for England. Gagey had a great career. Aston Villa and then came here. Brian Gale, you know, went to Man City, went to Ipswich, came here, captain us. Yeah. Andy Thorne, England under 21, played for Crystal Palace, Newcastle. Nigel Winterburn, Arsenal and England uh, there. Dennis Wise. England and Chelsea, uh, Vinnie Jones, uh, you know, where, well, Vinnie, where, where'd he go? I forgot, where'd he go to? Is it where'd Leeds? He, Leeds, wasn't yeah. it? Leeds here, Chelsea, Sanch. So Hollywood. Poor, yeah, poor old Sanch, he had to stay there. He played for Northern Ireland. Hodges, you know, Wales, Newcastle, Watford here, uh, Fashionu, uh, Aston Villa in England, and Alan Court, poor old Alan and Sanch had to stay. But... You know, so we didn't get the credit for what we achieved. No. They, they said, because the other teams used to moan about the way they played, because we were very physical in terms of running as well. We can handle ourselves, but they forget we were a very, very fit side. And so were the Sheffield United boys. They could keep going, you know, and, and we made it that we were working so hard that teams didn't like it. And they didn't want to come to Wimbledon and Bramall Lane. And mm. they wanted to come round and start strolling about, showing their skills. Well, they didn't have time because we never let them get their heads up for a start. So, of course, they kicked off. And they got people in the press who were more popular than me saying, this ain't the way for football. This is not the way to play and it, everything. And we were far too. They wanted Wimbledon's story to go up. But they wanted to be like Northampton and Carlisle. Go straight back yeah, from where you come sure. to. And all of a sudden, it didn't happen that way. So, you know. It happened, and of course, unfortunately, when I come to Shelford United, we're carrying that cross. So whenever we did adjust a bit, we, we didn't want an exact le replica of Wimbledon. You know, we had different characters and different people, but we never, you know, get the credit for it mm. at all. Do you know best ever signing you made? It's got to be up there, hasn't he? Dean? Yeah, Brian Dean. Oh, yeah. De well, yeah. We had jobs at Sheffield United, but mm. I mean, you know, when you think that, uh, you know, some of the players that we got Winterburn on a free transfer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, England, you know, and, and those players that come through the youth team and everything else, you know, Sanchez, you know, 29,000, did a brilliant job for Wimbledon, do you hear me? Mm. I mean, Fash was 150, but he did a brilliant. But again, Tony Agana, 40 grand, sold him for 750,000 quid. You know, against it. You know, we did, we a lot of the players. You know, Bryson did a great job for us. You know, yeah. but of course Dean was there. I so I, I mean, I think I've said to you, I think me Brian Dean is the greatest player in Sheffield United's history, for what he did in the five years uh, with it. Even above TC. 
Yeah, Keith well, Tony, listen, Tony, I love Tony Curry. He's a great player. But mm. for me, Brian Dean, what he did for Sheffield United. All right, somebody can say Tony did this and that for the club, and I'm not disputing that, yeah. you know, or whatever it is. But Brian Dean, you know, 30 goals in his first season, 24 in the second in promotion, and then he was up near 20 goals every season in the top division. And if we, and, and for me, what the worst thing that happened was that Reg decided that we was going to sell Tony Agana because I wouldn't have sold Tony Agana. I know he'd have stayed and he'd have had the ump with me, but we had 17 draws in that season and we only scored about 39 goals. Now, don't tell me Brian Dean wouldn't have got 10 goals in that season. Our highest scorer was Justin Flo, eight goals. Brian Dean would have said, we'd have been halfway up the table. We'd never, we had about 40 goals at the end of the season. Always, always 50-odd goals mm. in everything we did. And, and, of course, you know, Reg could have got his money with the Premier League. At the end of that season, the money was increasing. Brian could have gone for nothing. And, again, I think we should have offered Brian Dean in that last year. We should have, our, the, what the players were on, we, uh, that season we got relegated. Us, Swindon and Oldham were a million miles way behind on wages. We should have paid Brian Dean double what he was earning at Sheffield United to sign for us. Now, I still think he would have probably thought I need to go to Leeds. With hindsight now, he possibly could look back and think, I perhaps should have stayed at Sheffield United. But we should never have let him go. It was bad business. It was bad business. If Reg had said to me the Christmas before, Dean's going, and he's going, come what may, Dave, mm -hmm. And I'd have had to accept that because that's the club's bigger than me. We, we need that money. It's got to go. But there was about 700 grand owing to them, uh, that, uh, the brothers and everything else. Now, that season, you know, if we'd have kept up, Brian would have gone. It would have given me a year to find another striker. You with me? To look around and get. So, or I'm not saying we couldn't have got relegated the following year, but we would have been ready without Dean at that time. You with me? And basically, I'd about to said it to Brian, sorry, you're under contract, you're staying, you, mm. you keep us up. Now, all of a sudden, the club's another year on, more Premier League money, that 700 grand could have gone to Reg and his brother, who are supposedly good businessmen, you know, and they, they're useless, basically, because they couldn't see the picture of what was happening to the Premier League. And again, Reg didn't have the nerve to say to me at Christmas, Dave, Dean's going to go, come what may. I know you're upset and you want, but I'm giving you warning. You've got now till the end of the season, you know, to, to find a centre forward. We'll get good money for Dean and we'll buy a, a centre forward from somewhere. We can be paid off. You with me? Yeah. And if we'd have had that, because, you know, goal scoring was our problem. And we got relegated on the last day of the season uh, on that. We nearly, stuck, we nearly managed to do it, even with all that, yeah. with a strike force. Because I think Justin was about leading goal scorer on nine. And then there was somebody on about five. And they were all three. So, you know, 40 goals, you know, had done it. Arsenal, we drew 17. Arsenal drew 17. But the only thing is they only lost five whereas we lost more mm. and that. So, you know, uh, uh, I was bitter after that because I thought, you know, after all the work we've done, that Reg and his brother sold us down the river and sold Sheffield United. Because again, and the other thing that bugs me, that nobody from Sheffield, there's a lot of rich people in Sheffield, why didn't they come out and buy Brilly? You're telling me they want some rich, uh, you know, three or four Sheffield blokes together with a few million quid, couldn't have come in and said to Brearley and uh, Reg, which had been a, a joke, because Reg employed me, then we had all this Sam Hashimi rubbish, and then Paul Woolhouse, you know, and everything else. It was, a, you know, we, we did well, surprising. They talk about Abramovich and all the affecting the Chelsea players. You know, it, it was just crazy, really, because Sheffield United were in a wonderful position to establish themselves as a Premier League side, because the money was going up, and if it was managed properly, it would have been. And we ruined it. Sheffield United's podcast is sponsored by NordVPN, who are offering Blades fans a significant discount. Follow the link in the description and use the code THEBLADES to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan, plus one additional month for free. I, you've skipped ahead slightly to the Premier League bit, but I want to bring it back to the greatest day, I think, in many Sheffield United's minds, Sheffield mm. United fans minds, and that is Leicester of course. Cool, sure. It's just one of those games that you say Sheffield United, it, it follows in the same sentence. Yeah, what, well, what, I mean, what, what do you remember about what do you remember about that day? How, how vivid is it in your mind? Oh, 
it's very vivid, you know, I mean, you can't forget that day. <coughs> no, I was very nervous, I was very nervous, um, because Billy Whitehurst had a great chance and should have scored at Blackburn, and we'd have been up then, that night there. Mm. And all of a sudden you think, and then, you know, Leeds are with us there at Bournemouth, you think, yeah, they, you know, they're likely to win that. Newcastle had a game, there was, who were the others, I think, um, I forgot who the other teams was. There were all permuta permutations. We yeah. were in a good spot and everything else. But you think, well, you know, these things can spire against you, which they did at Chelsea many years later mm. as well. Um, but the boys, the spirit were good. And, um, you know, there was a, there was a, they, they were good. You know, they were, they were good. You know, even the subs like Billy were, oh, it's great, you know, in the dressing room. You know, we had good people. You know, there was no Billy big times there. there. And lads, we can win this game. We can win this game. You know, it's, it's, you know don't, don't panic or whatever it was. And they didn't. And we went one goal down and I was thinking, yeah, I was okay. But I could just see it. And then all of a sudden, the floodlights opened. And as soon as they equalised, I, th I thought, we're all right now. We're all right. I don't, I got, don't get me wrong, I didn't see the score as 5-2 and that. Because then all of a sudden, I think there was some adrenaline that came to them that all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. And of course, you know, you're there. There was hundreds of blades there in the lime green shirts. Yeah. It was a day. And, you know, it was a day where I'm thinking, blimey. You know, I've been here two and a half years, the first six months a nightmare, you know, trying to sort out, then the third division, and then this, two and a half years, sorry, mm. and now we're in the top league, and, you know, they hadn't played Manchester United, these big teams, for years, had they? No. At all. And, you know, of course, and the other thing that made it for the Blades was, with Sheffield Wednesday getting relegated, it couldn't have been any better for them, <laughs> could they? You know, I mean, so I think I can understand the, pla the supporters of that era you know, it couldn't have been any better, can you? Promotion to the top league and Wednesday going the other way. So, you know, I mean, that, that generation, you know, I mean, I still, if I come and I do dinners occasionally, you know, people say to me, that was my greatest day. You with me? Um, and yeah, I suppose it was my greatest day, but there was lots of other great days as well. You with me? Um, um, you know, uh, you, you, when it's your job, it becomes part of it where you, this is what, You've got to try and give. You've got to try and win the games. You've got to try and give the fans something to say. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always felt I've always done that with the fans. I don't think I ever tried to, you know, rubbish them and pretend that we played well when we haven't played well because I was, you know, a bit too vitriolic. And, and, I, and, you know, and I said things that probably would get slaughtered now as being disruptive to the dressing room, upsetting the players or wherever it is. Well, we had this tough love, you know, where... People were honest. The players used to give one another stick if they didn't do right. And the same with Wimbledon. You know, I mean, the abuse Vinny got when he first got in the team, you know, when he did some stupid things and things like that. I mean, he got sent off at Arsenal, you know, and there. He, they didn't say, oh, I'd love Vinny. They coated him. We lost 2-1. He got coated, you know, uh, and, and that, you know, and he, he knew. He took it. I mean, don't get me wrong. He learnt fast. Mm. You know, and, and I'm sure he, I know he coated players in years to come that didn't, that didn't play to the team. Some more stories here. Um, a lot of them kind of come to the same thing where you encourage the players to scrap and you, you didn't mind getting involved either. <laughs> um, Dame Whitehouse has sent me a story. Um, about pre-season trip to Norway, which you've touched on yep. earlier on. It says, we went out for a couple of beers one night. We all got on the coach after, and Harry decided he wanted to take the Sheffield lads on, so he took his shirt off, <laughs> came up to the back of the coach, shouting, come on, you Sheffield mugs, let's have it. So me, Bradshaw, and Wardy decided to rough him up, <laughs> and the next morning he came down to breakfast in agony. Uh, he only broke one of his ribs, and that'll teach him to try and take us on. And he finishes by saying, only I can say about Harry is thank you for believing me in as a player and giving me my debut. I owe a lot to him for my career. Total respect as a coach and a person. Yeah, well, nice, yeah. Eh? Yeah, my management, obviously a lot of people wouldn't because the same with uh, 
uh, you know, I, cr I used to create situations uh, at all. Um, I mean, yeah, 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 you know, I mean, I, you know, the Brads and, uh, you know, I, I love the Sheffield boys, you know, they used to You need to pick your battles more carefully, Dave. Oh, Take, taking on Carl Bradshaw, I mean, yeah, come on. Yeah, 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 I've, I've still got a dodgy neck from that, to be fair. I think I'll sue him. Um, yeah, you know, it was it was the way. I mean, to be fair, a few of the, uh, the other boys come up, I think they were giving me a few whacks as well. The London boys, I mean, they were thinking this is a chance to hit Harry. Um, Why yeah. did you do that? Why, why was that important to you? Well, it was, it was in a way that I felt an association with them really it was like fighting with your kids really you know and you, you sometimes yeah, but your kids don't break your ribs or at least well not yeah yeah they, yeah but i mean <laughs> I, I, you know they, they they take a chance i mean you know it wasn't full it was wrestling and yeah and that i mean i gotta say i was exhausted when i went home you know i was completely and utterly you know energy gone my wife wanted to know the hell i've been doing you know and uh, she wasn't too complimentary about me fighting with younger blokes <laughs> at all and that um but it was it was just one of those things where you know I used to provoke them as well you know and uh, you know and I I used to sometimes go up you know and say to them in training look we're gonna have a game north v the south you with me and I'm saying yeah come on about time these uh, companies got a few wax you know they're taking the Mickey you know and bits and pieces wind them up you know and then I used to go out to London I think they're ready to beat you up and all that you know so <laughs> it, it was it was you know and it was done in a, in a way that was was good and that but it was competitive and everything else but it created a bond i felt i mean obviously the management books and the leadership books would say well that's ridiculous you know you're, you're causing problems well i don't think you are because you know leadership to me is all about your personality it's not reading a book you can read a book and listen to what certain people have done but i've read books and i think well what have you done you know, have you ever have been in a dressing room? Have you ever actually had to deal with 20 odd players? Have you had to tell them you're not playing them and you disappoint them enormously? You know, one or two of the boys were really disappointed not playing at Wembley, like Bradshaw wasn't mm. and Rogers weren't. You with me? Uh, and, uh, but, and uh, the, the thing was, we lost that game and we had to play Leeds on the Tuesday after Wembley and we're still in the relegation. Bradshaw come back, uh, Beasley come back, and Rogers, and we beat Leeds here two one. If we hadn't have done that, I think we'd have got relegated as well. Yeah, yeah. The mentality of those players, Bradshaw, Rogers, and Beasley, I've got the highest respect for, because I played Franz Carl because I thought he uh, instead of Brad's because he'd yet been the only player that played at Wembley. The worst thing we did was, and I was part of it, was to get the game at Wembley. We should have played it at Ellen Road. I met John Sheridan at a dinner once. He said, Harry, we were so grateful that you punted the game at Wembley. He said, we'd have shit ourselves at Ellen Road. He said, against you lot, he said, with that there. But the mentality of those players and also the disappointment of all the other players that mm. have played that day, like, you know, Pemberton, Gale, Whitehouse, Gagey, Alan Kelly, you know, Gannon, they had all lost in a semi-final on the Saturday and they went out there against Leeds and we won. And then we won a few more games and we stayed up comfortably. So to me, that was a massive, massive game. And it showed to me, and I had the greatest respect for them because they could have easily felt sorry for themselves and they didn't. When the Premier League started, how did that change the players' world and, and your world, because the game just exploded then, didn't it? Well, the Premier League started slowly then, you know, it was the introduction of money and everything else, and of course this was going to have a big factor. That's why I said, you know, the, 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 the Dean sale was so mm. stupid, because yeah. there was money to be had and everything else. You know, uh, and again, we were behind the curve on wages, you know. The leadership at the top of the club at that time, they didn't know what was being paid in other clubs as wages and everything else. And, you know, I, as I said to you, I found out that managers were earning double, treble what I was earning was. And, you know, Dean's wages, you know, went there when he went. You with me? Mm. Brad's left when we got Norwich. You know, uh, all of a sudden we were way behind. And because we only had Derek Dooley who could find, and Derek was, I say, uh, a, a great strength to me, um, a real football man, you with me, uh, who understood football. He'd been there, he understood the dressing room uh, uh, and, and everything else. And in fairness to Reg, Reg did listen to Derek. 
but he didn't on the day when Reg had the casting vote to sell Dean, which was 3-2 than that. Um, and of course, the Premier League was going to explode because as, as time went on, this was the thing. It was going to be popular. The thing was on television more and it was just going to grow and grow. You just knew that was it. And what really didn't is, you know, with all due respect, Alan Laver was not really. Alan was a great supporter of the club. He was finishing. John Plant, who was on, you know, Reg and his brother, couldn't see the future. They couldn't see what the Premier League was going to do and how much money there was there. Mm. You know, just imagine if he was selling to McDonald, if we'd have been in the Premier League instead of in the EFA. Massive, massive yeah. money. How did you find adapting to Premier League football and coming up against these super clubs? Well, they were all super clubs before. You know, when we were there, that, that first season or so, don't tell me Manchester United and Brian Robson, all one that Manchester United, you know, getting paid peanuts and Liverpool and all them. You know, Rush was being sold for three odd million to Italy. You know, players were there. Mm. You know, so it was no different. But did, was, you have to, did you have to adapt your, your management style, how you dealt with players, how you approached these teams? Well, we always promoted uh, uh, there. We did all right, didn't we? We beat Manchester mm. United a good few times in the Cup and the league and various things. We beat Liverpool's, Tottenham's, you know, Chelsea's. You know, I remember us beating Tottenham 6 0, Chelsea 5 0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we won exactly, you know, we were, we were up there and everything else. There was no need, you know. I mean, you know, my management is, is to tell it as it is. You know, I'm, I'm not into, you know, buttering somebody up. You know, and I, I was never butted up. If you made a mistake, you, you had to accept it. Put your hand up and get on with it and learn. Mm. That's how you do. If you don't learn, you don't improve. And, you know, to be sort of soft-soaped was not the way because it was that, you know, management's different now. They see it. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. I think criticism is a great thing. You know, if it's done right and everything else, you know, criticism would have to be, you know, geared. But you know, that's, that's a learning, big learning process. Yeah, I mean, you, you kept United at the top for, what, four seasons? So that in itself, how did... How well, did... well we, we, we were there till the last game, the full yeah. season, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah, so we did well. I mean... But, I but think... what, what I'm coming to, Dave, is how, obviously, you had the achievement of the back-to-back -back promotions, which was amazing, but to keep Sheffield United up there, it's it's getting to the top, but staying to the top sometimes, that is really difficult. Well, they were great it? achievements to stay there. Yeah. I mean, you come up that year, um, I mean, you know, we had f four points after 17 games. Mm. And we had an unbelievable run uh, starting on January or when Hodges' his first game when we beat Derby. We went nine games, won seven and drew one. Then we lost a couple of games, then we won. We, we, we finished 13th in the league. We yeah. were dead and buried. Everybody thought we'd gone. Unbelievable. The, again, we had this strong mentality that the players, even we went uh, ten and nearly 11 hours without scoring in uh, October or whatever it is, September, October. We didn't score. And I remember we got a goal at Villa. We still lost 2-1. All the blades come on the pitch celebrating, dancing and everything, you know. <laughs> um, and and that, the, 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 the fans kept the spirit as well. And I think the players did. I mean, you know, at the end of that season, you know, uh, when we stayed up, I mean, Doug, I went to uh, Porter, but well, I went to Mallorca, uh, sorry, to Marbella, and Doug Ellis rang me up and he said, My boat's in Porter Banus, you know, I'm coming up to see you. And he came up and spent the day with me and my wife and the kids at the hotel, and he wanted me to be the Aston Villa manager at that time. And he was offering me double the money I was on at Sheffield United, and as a signing on fee, Double what I was earning at Sheffield United, which I can assure you was quite a lot of money. So why didn't you go? Because I, I believed I owed Sheffield United a favour. I'd done it, I'd gotten promotion twice, but... You owed them a favour? Yeah, well, that was, I'm, I'm quite a loyal bloke. I thought they could have sacked me any time up to those 17 games. I knew they wouldn't, because Derek said to me, what you've done, we can't sack you. But I, I, I knew they wouldn't. I, I, so I had great strength in that I wasn't looking over my shoulder to get the sack no. there. So I just thought, no, I can't. You know, they, we're, you know, I've done, we're all in this together. This is the wrong time to leave Sheffield United, you know. Uh, my wife, you know, goes back, she said, you should have gone, because football's like that, you know. She said, unfortunately, you, I've been loyal too many times. I did it at Barnsley. I should have gone to Blackburn. I'd only been at Barnsley four or five months, and, uh, and I turned it down, and I thought it was unfair 
to Barnsley to have accepted their job and then just jumped ship. You know, loads of other people probably would have done it. And I've got a lot of other managers said, Harry, you must be mad. And again, Barnsley, Blackburn were offering me double the dough while I was on at Barnsley. But you've got to have principles of what, of what, what you do. You've got to show... And those fans, I stayed with, like what I said to you, I stayed at, well, I wanted to stay at Wimbledon with them fans when I went for that time. Mm. I wanted to stay with the Sheffield boys. So all of a sudden, I'll jump on the bandwagon, cheers lads, I'm gone, all the best. <laughs> and that, um, you, you did it. I mean, the other time I should have gone when I was offered the Sunderland job when I was here. And again, I've turned it down, a mistake. They were at Roker Park and... Um, I went up there, they offered me the job, and Peter Reid got it after me. I should have gone then as well, you know, but uh, again, you know, when, when I got offered the Leicester job and the Chelsea job when I was here, um, I turned them down because they want the right job for me. You with me? Um, you know, probably, I, I like Sheffield, and, you know, if I get attached to players and they're there, um, you know, I think that's something great, you know, or I can look back and say I could have been a few million quid better off or whatever it was if I'd have gone to those clubs and done this, that and the other. But, as I say, money don't make you happy. You know, the, the, the thing I've had is, I've had some devastating times in football, but I've had wonderful times. I enjoyed my non-league career, playing at Wembley, playing for England, playing at Wembley, managing Wimbledon, playing the Football League, you know, doing all those things and then coming to Bramall Lane. And also, you know, at Forest, I've suffered there. You know, I got them promoted and everything else. And then all of a sudden, they sold players behind me back, you know. You know, Kevin Campbell was sold, you know, uh, uh, behind me back. And, you know, I should have gone then. Then Van Oydonk went on strike. You know, you, you two, two players who have scored between them, you know, 53 goals. All of a sudden, you've gone. It's not easy. And then C Colin Cooper was sold because the share price didn't go right. And then at Christmas, I get the sack. You know, uh, and Ron Atkinson thought he could keep him up. Then he found out he couldn't. And, you know, I paid the price at Nottingham Forest and no, didn't deserve it. I, I won the championship in style at Forest, you know, playing totally different football with what everybody thought, you know. Again, I got criticised in nice days. If a Forest player hit a long ball, you know, oh, the long ball's back. You know, there was Graham Sooness sitting in the midfield at Liverpool, spraying a ball about and everything else. What a fantastic ball that is. What, Glenn Otto, oh, what a wonderful ball. You know, uh, but, you know, football's full of people who talk bullshit, really. Yeah. Um, talking about devastating times, the Chelsea day, when you got relegated from the Premier League, quarter past four, everything's fine, quarter to five, you're down. Um, and the, well, it was the, even the, later the, than it that. It probably was, yeah, it was. But the circumstances of the events of that day, the way everything seemed to conspire, must have obviously really hurt. That must have really compounded things. Well, it, it, well, it happened. You know, we were 2-2, we were comfortable and, and uh, everything. I made a mistake. I should have sent Alan Cork on and told him to say to Wisey, we need a draw. Because <laughs> why has he crossed the ball? Glenn Oddle went in the box for the first time in his life and flicked it on and Steen hit the ball and it's one of those first time that crept in. And Keith Cooper, the referee who I got on really well, was a great lad. And he said, Harry, he said, if only I could have seen that. He said, I, he said it was 94 minutes. I could have easily blown my whistle a minute earlier. And that was it. And of course it was devastating because Wimbledon were winning 2-0 at um, Everton and Wimbledon all season had never lost when they were in front this one they lost 3-2 and when I saw the goals unbelievably unbelievable the third goal that Anne Seegers let in it had worms on it the ball had worms on it you know Joe Royal rung me up he said Harry it stunk that game Lenny Lawrence they was there and rung me and said, Harry, it was a weird atmosphere. There was an unusual this, that and the other. The coach burning, he said, it stinks, you know. And a lot of people said to me, something kicked off to that day. And Vinny said to me, Harry, I'm not telling you. I said to him once, something kicked off. He says, none of your business. He, he said, you don't need to know. Uh, uh, so something happened there. Southampton, uh, uh, or was it West Ham? There was one of them, I think it was Southampton. Uh, they drew three all, but the referee finished the game three minutes early and no, no added time because the West Ham fans invaded the pitch. And then field. three minutes there. Blackburn drew at home nil nil. Alan Shearer didn't play. Uh, you know, first time they hadn't scored at home. Nil nil. You with me? 
uh, and you just think, and uh, you know, and of course, I then think, if we'd have had Brian Dean, we'd have never been in that position. We'd have been mid -time. we'd have been, well, we'd have been, we wouldn't have been in the bottom three. Mm. We wouldn't have been, because Ipswich would have gone down. If we'd have drawn that 2-2, two -two, Ipswich were gone. And Southampton, you with me? Um, so I became bitter after that towards there. And really, I should have left Sheffield United then. Because I didn't get my act together at the start of that season, because I carried it on. And that was a weakness by me. It was a weakness, because I didn't really get myself to it. And it was September before I got my head around it, and it was a bit too late. I, finished, I think we finished seventh or eighth that year. We left ourselves too much to do, mm. and I should have been at it. We won the first game, Watford, 3-0, uh, and, and uh, you know, the pre-season wasn't as good. So, you know, really, uh, I should have just said to Reg, let's call it a day, pay me up, and I'll go. Uh, uh, you know, you've done me. Uh, and, and then, of course, it finished up with Reg trying to sell the club, as he was always trying to do. And, uh, you know, the following season, things had deteriorated. You know, there was no money. I couldn't, you know, spend any money, this, that and the other. There was no money to do. We just had to get on with it and everything else. And, uh, you know, Reg was there and this was going on with McDonald in the background. And uh, I knew he didn't want me as manager. You know, when, when you somebody buys a club, they don't want the manager. They want their own man, which I understand. It's all mm. part and parcel, you know. And I could sense the, the, the buzzards circling. You know, Adrian Heath was seen at our games, you know, watching, you know, uh, I knew Howard Kendall was their choice, and Howard Kendall, good manager, no, no, no nothing wrong with Howard, he, and that, and so I knew my days were numbered, and everything else, and again, I sold myself short on the payoff there, really, with Wimbledon, you know, uh, sorry, with Sheffield United, I should have got more money, but, uh, you know, it, it was there, it was time to call it day, it was a sad day, it was a sad no, day. I bet it was, I bet it was. Um, I've got some more stories here. Yeah. Kevin Gage, um, do you remember your video analysis? You know when we touched on this earlier on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a great story here from Kevin Gage about how you docked, not you personally, but the person who was cutting the videos for you. Vince Craven, was it? Yeah, Vince Craven, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you got to, uh, we've got to be careful because this is a family show. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to skirt around yeah, it, yeah, which, is why, which really is why it's taking me a long time exactly. to get to it. Um, but he cut in some scenes from... Blue movies yeah. into the video analysis, yeah. and that was your way of trying to keep the players yeah, that's right, engaged. Yeah. Was it? Now, remember your audience here, Dave. Yeah. What? what where did that idea come from? Well, there, there, there was also other things. Uh, Kevin forgot to mention there was a few boobs floating about <laughs> and everything else um, going on. But also there was comic things. Vince was there, a comedian making some saying, or not, not, you know. Tommy the, Cooper was, yeah, was yeah, he involved? Yeah, yeah, that's in right. You yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. So Vince was very clever. He was a, a bright fella. He did all the video. We got there. And funny enough, you know, the amazing part was Arsenal, Don Howe knew Vin mm. and, and knew what we was doing. And he went down to Wimbledon, the Arsenal there, come to Wimbledon to see what we were doing with videos and cutting them up and everything else. And then took it to the Arsenal, got Vince to do Arsenal right. as well. And Vince had a room about as big as this. We believe it or not, with all sort of like you, the um, the cartridge machines you had it, it was unbelievable, and that and um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, there was there was things like all of a sudden there would be, and then all of a sudden there'd be some boobs flashing and this that and the other, and, and of course, but but there was also some funny, a lot of other funny things. You know, just to do it. Because when players are there, you get their attention. You know, you start Oh, watching, I bet you got their attention. Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, and of course, when they're thinking, what's coming next? What's coming? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, it was one of the innovations there. You know, I mean, the, the, the problem is that the people I talk to now think that football was only invented since the Premier League. Yeah. They thought that the people, the managers and coaches before then didn't have a clue. They, you know, George Graham, the terrific manager. Uh, Al Wilkinson, very clever bloke, you with me? Jim Smith, 
was the, uh, with the Howard Kendall, superb manager. These blokes all knew football and everything else. I learned a lot from these people. And, you know, people like Ian Greaves, who I was on courses, I went on courses, right bright fella, you with me? And they thought we didn't, you know, we were spent time with video analysis and everything else. You know, we, we started a lot of it. I think we probably were. I'm not saying we were the first team, but, you know, and again, we, with a lot of the things that we did, you know, in football, you know, have seen that this all of a sudden they're the only way invented. It was just part of progression. Mm. Jamie Hoyland. He says, um, Dave had a knack of calling players by the wrong name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before one game at Old Trafford, he was going through their team and a new exciting prospect who just got in called Ryan Griggs yeah. and Clayton Blakelock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Clayton Blackmore, obviously. Yeah. The lads were bursting to laugh. His Jim Layton talk before the semi-final is another classic. Yeah, well, we, Tell me. Yeah, I've forgotten that one, to be fair. Yeah, you'll have to, you, you should have asked Jamie on that particular one. But no, I mean, I play golf now and I play with charity and I play with three different blokes and they say, my name's John, my name's Wilf, my name's that. I said, well, you'll probably be Colin by the end of it, you'll be Peter by the end of it. <laughs> I, with names, I don't concentrate on, on, on that. And yeah, I, I'm a bit like Jack Charlton and that, that you know, Get certain get names uh, in in the wrong order. You with yeah. me? Sometimes again, my my, my, my mouth talking before my brain's functioning properly. My brain's gone in the front and uh, <laughs> comes out. But that's the way. It is. They got used to me. They knew that. I think and the they, Jim Layton one, uh, if memory serves me right, I think you're kind of talking at the lads and saying we've got Jim Layton here, uh, who's won this, that, and the other. Oh yeah, yeah. How many how many semi finals have you won? And he turns around and says, well, none. Is it, is it something along yeah, those lines? Yeah, it might lines? have been. Yeah, it could have been. It might so you, have you given, basically, you, you've given Jim Layton the big send Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, he's had yeah, to turn around and yeah, say, well, I'm, 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 I'm actually not, one. I'm not disputing that, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, you, Jim Layton's there. He's done everything. He'd, he'd won in Scotland. He'd played in the cup finals for Manchester yeah. United and everything else. You know, I'm saying, here, yeah, boys, he's done it. You you haven't done it now uh, as such. So, you know, it's quite, it's quite conceivable that, uh, you know, I've made a few mess-ups. And, and Jamie says, you know, he inspired so many players to go on and stay in the game, whether coaching or management, as he showed us it was all about team spirit and honesty and how to pull a group of players together. Also massively ahead of his time, bringing in sports science and video analysis, which he never got any credit for. And again, we've, we've kind of covered that. Chris Wilder. The first thing he said to me, Chris, was he said the biggest thing about Dave was he invited me to his 50th birthday, which he says was class. He was taken aback by it completely taken aback that you'd remembered and you'd invited him there for his 50th birthday but he did share a story about after games apparently you always used to say to the players be on the bus for a quarter to six but you turn up at 6 p.m walk down the bus having a pop at everyone Bradshaw Ward White House and uh, it'd be bedlam at the back of the bus and again tells the story about scrapping with the players lots of the values he took from you um, which I think is enormous credit to you when you look at the career he's had as well. Yeah, yeah, as a yeah. manager, you just take great pride in what yeah, Chris yeah, has achieved. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. You know, he's, he's, he always stayed in touch when he was at Halifax. He rang me a few times when Oxford. He actually asked me to go to the hotel before Oxford played in the playoff final at Wembley to mm. talk to the players and that. You know, and and he, if he had a problem, we we spoke and you know, uh, and, and that particular time. I mean, you know, again, luckily, you know. Kevin McCabe was going to give Nigel Atkins another year. And I said, you're going to lose Chris Wilder. You know, he's the best man, you know, to, to do it. He's just one promotion, this, that and the other. He's a blade and uh, he was just going to go sign with Cholton. And fortunately, I said to Kevin, Kevin hadn't, well, I'd, I'd worked with Kevin on managers before mm. and he'd blanked me. Because, you know, uh, you know, he picked managers, he, he asked me to help him and make discussions. You know, he, he appointed Danny Wilson, you know, which he was entitled to do, but Danny was never there. He just decided he met Danny in La Manga and he thought Danny was the right man. And Danny's a good man, you with me? Yeah. But then he decided to go for David Weir. You know, unbelievable, who had never been a manager or anything else. He'd obviously met David Moyes, who spoke well of him, and he thought, oh, this is the new young manager I, I'm going to have. And, you know, I'd, pu I'd push Chris Wilder uh, before, before Nigel Adkins, you with me? Mm. But he'd blanked it, and this time he took him. And they're good. And I knew Chris would do a good job for him. Listen, I didn't know Chris was going to do as well as he was, but I knew he'd do a 
a good job because he, he sort of grew up with it. With it. He, you know, I knew he managed to side on a Sunday and he had his own team and, and that. I mean, Chris had a hard time with me, you know, because I was always on his case because he wasn't always the quickest right back. You with me? And, you know, I remember us losing 6-0 at Leeds and he got destroyed and that was him out of the team for quite a while. But he always kept coming back. He went on loan and then he got murdered at, Man at West Ham by uh, the winger there. We lost 5-2 or something. And Chris found himself out in the team. But he was there when we got promoted. He played in the top league for us. Technically, very good player. Tough uh, uh, about it, you know. He's not the quickest. Not the quickest. That's, that was the problem, you know. Uh, so that's why I got Kevin Gage, who I knew was quick. And uh, you need that in the Premier League, unfortunately. But uh, he's, he's, he's had a, you know, done a brilliant job as, as a manager. And, you know, I'm pleased for him. And, I, you know, I love it when me, me other managers, you know, why is he should have stayed in the game longer instead of leaving Leeds? Mm. You know, he had ways to, 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 to deal with it, really. You know, there was, they, they all sort of ended up in a, in a way. Sanchez did well, you know, managed Ireland and Fulham. Should have done a little bit better at Fulham. And if they Besson had a great career as a goalkeeping coach uh, I'm just trying to think on, on the others Corky yeah Corky did scouting and, and everything else and Wally Downs you know a top coach and everything else you know brought Wally to uh, Shelford United you know, one of the funniest thing it wasn't really the greatest thing because we played at Leeds in that 5-0 uh, drubbing uh, uh, not 6-0 5-0 and Wally got sent off uh, very after the, they scored which didn't help and then he, he served a suspension come back for Bradford City game and I didn't realise Kennedy who was at Portsmouth we'd always had some there he tried to be the big time boy and I made a mistake and then Wally's done him and got sent off didn't he and we're going home on the, the, the car all the way down and I think George Kerr was going on he said it's a new name to uh, to a new name on the horizon who's more loathed in Sheffield than Sutcliffe the Moor's murderer, Wally Downs. <laughs> <laughs> Wally sunk in his chair. <laughs> 16 years is spent in Sheffield. Yeah, yeah, great. I know, I know you're back down south now, but you obviously spent felt a special connection with the place. Yeah. I love Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. The weather's rubbish, you know. But, uh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I had a great time in Sheffield. I loved it. I thought it was a good, good place. I enjoyed the people um, uh, and that. It was great. I mean, my, the funny part was when my wife come up, she sort of used to the south. You know, we're going into different places and they're all talking. We said, who are they? I said, I don't know. They're supporters. Well, why are you talking to them? They're nosy. I said, shut up. They're supporters. Well, well, when we went back to uh, South, she's gone in like she, she got used to it, and the ladies serving her in the weight shows and or wherever it, where she went used to say, "Hello, you love," and all this they'd be talking down there. They don't even talk to you. She said, "Oh, I didn't realise how snotty people are in the <laughs> South." She said, and that. But no, it was a good place. I loved it. You know, I mean, it was a good place to live. But uh, my wife's father had a um, uh, stroke and uh, we were too far away they mm. couldn't come and so you know she said look you know we are, you're working at Leicester you know you're traveling 70 miles all right you might have to do 90 miles from where we are so she said it's time to return but I I, whenever I come I, I, I love it I just get a feeling even today well, I dropped my car in Peniston for a summit I needed to do and then waited and come back and driving through and you know I had a little drive around and uh, you know I loved it up in Sheffield it's great to see your enthusiasm for the game still. I mean, that's clearly never, never waned, has it? Well, when you've got a passion for the game, it, you, you, it's part and parcel. That is the way I am. And when, if I'm football mad, I'm not passionate about doing gardening, which my wife regards, reminds me of, uh, to, and doing the DIY. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I'm not allowed to do anything. You know, my wife thinks uh, if it hadn't been for football, I'd have been completely useless to a woman. <laughs> well, you were, you were very, very useful here. Um, obviously, well, well thought of and rightly so. And I said right at the top, you are. A legend of the lane and we, we could have probably done another three hours and I don't think we'd have struggled yeah I mean but. you know for me to be voted the greatest manager in Sheffield United history is a great accolade you know I mean you know going back to you know the Harry Haslam's and people it's difficult to remember them sort of thing you mm. know uh, and but it's, a, it's a, a great thing to do that and, and luckily I was also voted Wimbledon's greatest manager ever to do that you know when nobody else has ever done it with two clubs I think actually Alec Ferguson's done it now with Aberdeen and Manchester United. But, you know, I, re I really appreciate 
those awards, they mean a, a lot to me in, in terms of, of what. And as I say, I, I, you know, the first six months at Sheffield United was difficult, but I knew that and I knew we could build on it. The last period, as I say, the 18 months probably was, I was bitter because I felt that we'd sold ourselves down the river. I'd seen the vision but nobody else and nobody wanted to listen to what I say. They said, you know, they were just concerned about their own situation. And I think if Sheffield United could have capitalised on that now, I think they would have been a Premier League side all along if they had the people right there. And as I say, it just sort of disappoints me that no consortium in Sheffield didn't take over from the Brearleys. They could have done. Mm. And then they probably, as a Premier League club, they could be selling it now for absolutely billions. It's been brilliant to see you. Thank you. Great Cheers. to see you in Pleasure. good health as well. Stay well. Yeah. All right. Yes. Cheers. Thank you very much. Ladies and gents, it is Dave Bassett. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've gone a bit like that all the way through, but there are so many stories we tried to touch on, and there's probably loads of stories we didn't get to touch on, but hope you've enjoyed it, and we shall see you again soon. Thanks again, Dave. Pleasure. And thanks for watching.